Amen. Uh, we're going to get right into it this morning. I, uh, we got back from Israel with a group of 20 on Friday night and uh, had a great trip. I mean, so getting to go and read the stories in Scripture where they happened, whether it's uh, on the Sea of Galilee or in Jerusalem or at the Dead Sea, I mean, just place after place, you know, it makes it where you never read the Bible the same again. But if I'm being really honest with you, it was a very challenging trip for me. Um, challenging because of this. this, this darn series we're going through right now. Um, you know, sitting here thinking about um, the idea that there are, there are problems in our hearts and our minds that we need God to fix, right? There, we, we, we look at our lives and we don't see them measuring up all the time to the image of Jesus, right? Um, and so we're there, and if you want a chance for all your flaws to come out, spend 12 days with 20 other people, night and day, tired, walking 81 miles. Um, you know, we're, we're reading the Word, we're having these great experiences, but I'm constantly finding myself, just my flaws, just, just coming out. You know, just uh, repenting in one moment, and the next moment, and do the very, very thing I repented for. Um, and so I, I realized that, that what we're talking about, this idea of who's seated at your table and dealing with uh, getting freedom. You know, the external areas in our life are actually very, fairly easy to get freedom in, I think, compared to the internal ones. Um, but it's those internal places that I think we really find the beauty in the presence of Jesus. Uh, when we find ourselves on our face saying, Jesus, I realize I don't have the ability to change. I try and I can't. It is only you that sets me free. And in casting truly all of our cares and our burdens upon him to bring freedom to our life. And so my hope and my prayer for you is not that you have lots of issues. My prayer is that the issues you do have, that you're, you're learning to take them to Jesus and you're experiencing freedom. So turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 23, verse 1. And we're going to start reading here. This is the portion of scripture that we're using um, and digging into, in particularly one verse. But Psalm 23, 1 says this, The Lord is my shepherd. We know this chapter, right? We've, we've read this many times. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. All oh, this sounds pretty good. For his name's sake, verse 5 is our key verse. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So verse 5 is where we've been focusing, and this is this idea. What, what is said here is he prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Most of those verses sound pretty good, but this is, this is a little bit different verse. So the idea is this, is that when we come to Christ, that Jesus prepares a table for us, in the presence of our enemies. In other words, they're there. Well, that doesn't necessarily sound like, who wants to be around their enemies? Well, the truth is they're all around. But in the midst of our enemies being there, God has prepared a feast for us. The problem comes into, and this is what we've been talking about, is the devil is always trying to get an invitation to sit at the table with us. The Bible says that he uses traps or snares. He uses things to get an invitation. And then all of a sudden, this feast this abundant life that we're supposed to have in Christ doesn't feel like an abundant life. It doesn't feel like a feast. Are you guys with me? And so what we're trying to learn to do is, first of all, not give the devil an invitation to our table. Secondly, if we've given him one, let's, let's uninvite him. Let's figure out how to get him away from our table. So who's at your table? And these are the things I want you to think about. Is it peace or is it chaos? Is it anger or is it love? Is it unforgiveness or is it grace? Is it fear or is it trust? Is it joy or happiness? Because the truth is God wants you free. And Jesus, the truth is Jesus paid the price for you to be free. And, and I really wanna say this every week. There are two main reasons and we can't miss this. There are two main reasons Jesus wants you free. First of all, simply because he loves you. But we can't stop there, right? I feel like too many times we just stop there. He wants me free because he loves me. That is the first reason. But the second reason I think is equally important. He wants you free so you can serve him. 
He wants you free so that you can fulfill the purposes on your life. Because guys, if you're in bondage, you're not going to fulfill very much of what God has for you. So we can't live in this place of just thinking, okay, God just loves me, he wants me free. Yes, that is true. But he also wants me free because he wants to use me. And it's okay to say that. It's okay to say that God wants to use us. A person in bondage to self cannot, or a person in bondage to to any of these things cannot be used very effectively for God. So we've talked about uh, one of the invitations we give to the enemy is offense. And I hope that if you're finding yourself easily offended, you're taking that to the Lord and you're asking for freedom there. Secondly, a few weeks ago, we talked about fear and how the devil uses fear to get us seated at our table. And then I just want to thank Sharia. She did a phenomenal job of sharing the word with you guys last week. Amen? Amen. Um, today, we're going to talk about how the devil uses the snare of, and I, I tried to pick which word I wanted to use, but I just settled on self-centeredness. The devil uses the snare of self-centeredness to get an invitation to our, to our table. And, I, and I've got a definition for you in self-centeredness that I think describes what I'm trying to get at maybe better than the word itself. It is a preoccupation with your wants, your desires, and your feelings. The devil uses an invitation to get a seat at our table by getting us to focus too much on ourself. What we think and what we feel, what we desire, and what we want. And we see this in the very beginning of of the Bible. In Genesis chapter three, the devil tempted Eve by making her the center of the story instead of God. He made it about what she saw, how she felt, and how it impacted her in order to get a seat at her table. The devil will use self-centeredness to get us to focus on ourselves, And when we get focused on ourselves instead of Christ, it is every time an invitation to devil come have a seat. I want to read to you 2 Timothy 3.1. And as I read it, I want want you to tell me if you recognize uh, what what Paul is describing here in the last days as, as, you know, it's kind of like you're reading from the headlines. It's it's rampant in our culture. Just let me read it to you. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. So I don't care what you believe about when the last days are, I think you'll be able to see the rest of this in our culture currently. Verse two, so what will it be like? Number one, for men will be lovers of self. I wanna, what are you, you're saying that that lovers of self is a bad thing. I would tell you that, that a lot of people are gonna struggle with what Paul is saying here, because we are taught in our culture today to love yourself. We are taught in our culture today to love ourselves first before anything, before anyone else. And in fact, we are taught that if you don't love yourself first, you cannot be healthy. I challenge your thinking on that if that's what you think. Let's keep reading it. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they've denied its power. So what was the first characteristic listed in the last days? Lovers of self. Paul says here, that lovers of self is a bad thing. Now, if you have been taught something different, hang in there with me. I hope it'll it'll make sense here in just a little bit. I I wanna challenge your thinking to the idea that the most important person you love is yourself. A few quotes from commentaries on on this passage. It is no accident that the first of these qualities will be a life that is centered on self. So again, as he lists all, and he unpacks all these descriptions, characteristics of the last days, the very first one is lovers of self, right? The the adjective used here is philatos, which means self-loving. Love of self is the basic sin from which all others flow. The moment a man makes his own will, the center of life, divine and human, relationships 
are destroyed. Obedience to God and charity to men both become impossible. The essence of Christianity is not the enthronement, but the obliteration of self. Another quote from a commentary, lovers of self aptly heads the first, aptly heads the list since it is the essence of all sin and the root from which all the other characteristics spring. The the word is literally self-lovers and points to the fact that the center of gravity of the natural man is self rather than God. This is certainly the characteristic of this age. Men and women, young and old, boys and girls are encouraged to love themselves first. People are told to love themselves unconditionally and that such self-love is the foundation for a healthy human personality. This is not only in the secular world, this has definitely made its way into the church. It's in sermons about identity. They say you need to understand who you are in order to be healthy. Guys, you need to understand who God is to be healthy. It is not if I can just understand myself better and who I am that I'll be a healthier individual. No, it is the more I'm focused on Jesus that I actually understand who I am. It's in counseling about loving. When I say counseling, it's in Christian counseling. Let me read you a few quotes from Christian counseling websites I got. Christian counseling websites. Who is the most important person in your life? Your answer may be a factor in how healthy you are. Whenever we work with patients on improving their overall health, we start by asking them a simple question. Who is the most important person in your life? Many people answer that the most important person is their child, their parent, their spouse, or some other loved one. But the real answer is you. You are the most important person in your life. Most of us are raised to believe that putting ourselves first is selfish. It's worth considering the consequences of failing to make your needs your first priority. That should blow your mind and heart. Another Christian counseling website says this, their, their, basic, their most basic concept, they say they start from this concept, you are the most important person in your life. Guys, you will not find Jesus saying anything remotely close to this. In fact, if he would say, what's most important? Who's most important? He would say, the Lord thy God, right? He is most important. Who's second? It's your neighbor. It is not that we demean self or that we degrade self. It is that true health comes from focusing on Jesus, not on who we are. The truth is we don't need to be encouraged to love ourselves. We naturally, from God, have such a love. But neither should, we be taught to hate, neither should we be taught to hate ourselves. Romans 12, 2 says this, do not be conformed to this world. So what this world's saying is not what God says. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Verse three, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. We must see ourselves as we really are, both the bad that's in the flesh and the glory that that we have in Christ. It is this idea that self is most important that that has our culture in the place that it is. Do what feels good to you. If you feel like you're a woman, then be a woman. If you feel like you're a fairy, be a fairy. If you feel like you're attracted to young children, that's okay. Do what feels right to you. Now, basically what I've said, most of you probably like, of course we'd never get that far. But guys, it starts much simpler. Paul goes on to say in 2 Timothy 4, 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. I said to you a minute ago, this, we hear this in sermons today that, that it's being preached all over that, that, that really if we could just understand how great we are in Christ, let me rephrase that, if we could understand how great we are, then we would get healthy. We hear it in Christian counseling, we hear it in worship songs played on the radio all the time about how great we are. 
Praise God for the songs that we sang this morning that were about how great God is. We hear it in prophecies that we give to each other that elevate man instead of Jesus. It doesn't say if man will be lifted up, he'll draw people. He says, if I'll be lifted up, I'll draw people, right? We, we, don't, we don't get transformed by lifting up each other. We, get, we, we help each other transform by lifting up Jesus. We don't need to fall more in love and devoted to ourselves. We need to fall more in love and devoted to God and his purposes. You will not get in his presence one day and think how great you are. You will get in his presence and realize how great he is. Some say that you have to learn to love yourself first before you can love others. But guys, this is a worldly idea. It is not, not an idea from God. It actually doesn't work. This puts you at the center. And never, ever can we put man at the center and expect transformation. Now I realize that some people have an unhealthy view of themselves. But again, you don't fix that by focusing on you. You fix that by focusing on the one who brings freedom. John the Baptist said, I must decrease that he must increase. But we hear in the world and in the church, I must increase and he must decrease. There is a cultural, a cultural and religious validation of self-centeredness. In other words, the culture is validating that self-centeredness is good, and guys, the church is doing it as well. And we need to spend some time undoing the mindsets that have validated it. I, I think we've drifted so much into it, we don't even realize it. Just like we live in a time that has validated many ideas that are contrary to what God says, we live in a time that loving ourselves is validated. We've strayed so far from a proper understanding of self that most Christians can't even reconcile simple theologies about things like what it'll be like in heaven one day. Let me read you a verse, 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. What, I, what I'm trying to get you to see is that we, we've strayed so far from a healthy understanding of who he is and who we are that we can't even wrap our minds about what heaven will truly be like when we, when we appear before Jesus. No, of course, Jesus would never give rewards to some and, and not to others. I'm not talking about entrance. I'm talking about the rewards that are taught in Scripture because that would be separating people, which leads to the idea that, that I hear people say all the time, like, God's not, you know, God would never be displeased with you. Let me ask you this, if your kid was caught in some type of horrible sin, would you still love them but be displeased? But pastor, doesn't, doesn't God cast our sins as far as from the east as from the west? Absolutely, when it comes to, you don't have to pay the price for them. But when it comes to a loving father who wants to see us transformed into the image of his son, he cares about how we live our life. We shouldn't be walking around like God is pleased with us if we're in sin. We should not be walking around like God is pleased with us if we're not serving him. God is not pleased if we're in sin. He's not pleased if we're not serving. He is not pleased if we're not givers. For the servant child of God to grow self must be, I'll use the words from the commentary, obliterated. Where do we see forms of self playing out? Let me read you Luke chapter 14, verse 7, because I, my, my hope is this morning that, that we find, if applicable in our lives, some self, we identify it, and we get rid of it. Luke 14, 7 says, When he noticed how the guest were securing places of honor, he told them a parable. When you've been invited by someone to attend a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone who is more distinguished than you may have been invited. And then the host who invited both, you may approach you and say, give this man your place. 
Then you will be embarrassed as you proceed to sit in the lowest place. Rather, when you are invited, proceed to sit in the lowest place so that when your host arrives, he will say to you, my friend, move up to the higher place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. I would say much of the church would reject that parable from Jesus. They would say things like, I'm the head and not the tail. I go and I, and I am royalty and I do this. Guys, let me tell you what happens in heaven one day. The Bible tells us that there's elders, and, and these are specific people that because of what they've done, they have a, a, they have a special, special seat in heaven around the throne of God. So they've served him really faithfully, really amazingly, and God has given them crowns and set them on their head. But when worship starts in heaven, does everyone know what happens to those crowns? They take them and they throw them at, their, at the feet of Jesus. They say, in the presence of Jesus, even the crown you've given us, we're not worthy to, to hold on to and wear. I've realized that the vast majority of the times that I get angry or frustrated, it is rooted in self-centeredness. If you are a person that is angry often, let me say it this way, if your family would say that you're angry often, then you are probably a person that is pretty consumed with yourself. Because the reason most of us get angry and frustrated is because something didn't go our way. We don't like the way something happened. And so what I was finding in myself these last couple of weeks is, is like getting aggravated or frustrated or, or something, and people weren't doing anything. It was me. It is just the, the junk inside of me that is just self-centered and self-focused and self-exalting and self-glorifying that wants my way. I'll take it back even more basic than that. We have stopped valuing in our culture, including church culture, we've stopped valuing the idea of humbling ourselves and exalting other people. Let me tell you one place I noticed it a lot. It isn't how we're training up young men this day, today. It wasn't that long ago that, young, that men held the door open for women, that food set at a table, you let other people eat first, that you carried someone else's back, I mean, that, you, that you, you, you served. It wasn't that long ago. And guys, I just don't see it in very many of our young men anymore. And I don't think it was just when it comes to young men honoring and serving women, it's not just an issue of male and female. I think that it's something that teaches us to put other people first. And in fact, this, isn't this what Jesus says? Doesn't he say to, to put other people in front of ourselves, other people's needs and wants in front of our own needs and wants? Doesn't he teach that? And is that not contrary to the Christian counseling promotion I just read you? If you shut down a lot, maybe you're not angry. Maybe you would say, I, you know, I, I shut down a lot. If you're frustrated, you just kind of, okay, I don't get angry, I don't blow up, but I just kind of back up and I shut down. I would, I would challenge you that probably the reason that you do that is self-centeredness. Do you guys get what I'm saying without going into big explanations? Like, so some people just get mad and they're always angry and always griping, and it's really just self-centeredness because they're focused on them and what they like and want. But if you just back up and shut down, it's really the same thing. You don't get your way because we're, we're, we don't get our way, so we're focused on ourselves and we get mad. Or you're always having to talk about how you feel. Are you, as we talked about a few weeks ago, offended easily? Guys, we have taken what the Bible says is a vice and the culture has made it a virtue. For the, for the child and servant of God to be equipped to serve him in, in, in even part, in, in half of the capacity that, that God has intended, self has to be killed. We're to take up our cross and follow him. We're not to elevate ourselves and think how great we are. We, 
We, we need to be a people, as I've been sharing every week, that, that are falling on our face before Jesus and saying, everything that's in me that's not of you, God, I want out. We, we, we need to, how we fight for freedom is not as the world would fight for freedom. We, we go to the one who sets us free and we sit at his feet until we are. Here, here's what I'm learning. I, I can't fix me. I can try. I can give focus. Here's what, man, so many times, oh my gosh. I would repent to the Lord this last week about how things that would come out of my mouth. Quit laughing at me, Megan. I would repent to the Lord, and in 30 seconds, I would do the same thing. I mean, literally. And I would just look at Kim's like, how did that happen? You know, how, how did I just do the thing I just repented of doing? And I realized that I can't free me, but he can. And I'm determined to, to be on my face at the feet of Jesus until he brings freedom. Knowing that this is too deep-rooted, this flesh is too nasty, it's too ugly, it's, it, is, it wants its own. It wants what it wants and it's not going to give up, but Jesus can set me free. Guys, whether it's fear or offense or self-centeredness, the enemy is sitting outside of our table. He's, he's waiting for an invitation. Now, we don't ever look at the enemy and say, hey, come have a seat. What we do is we start listening to what he has to say and buying into it, which invites him to come have a seat. We don't get offended. I mean, guys, as a believer, you have no rights to be offended. You don't. If you're offended, repent. As a follower of Jesus, we've given up our rights to self. And we've decided that, that the blood that bought us was so precious and so amazing that we want to give our lives to him and his purposes. And we die to self. We don't grow in self-love. I hope you guys understand what I'm saying. The truth is to grow in self-love could be healthy if you did it by focusing on Jesus. Then he does the growth. By focusing on self-love, you never will attain it. It'll be a farce. It'll be fake. It won't be real. You'll always be striving for it. Of course, self-centeredness shows up most in those relationships with people that we're closest to, right? Spouses, can I get an amen? You know, those are the people we take for granted and we're willing to demand our rights. Let me tell you, I just said you don't, you know, we've given up our rights to follow Jesus. Do you realize that even when it comes to your spouse, that applies, if not more so? I choose to follow and obey you over my own rights that I'm demanding. There are things my wife wants to go do and I don't want to do it. And she will give me the option, right? Oh, you don't have to come. Now, if she really didn't want me to come, praise the Lord, but I know. I don't want to do that. I want to do what I want to do. That does not sound fun. That does not sound appealing. But guys, those are some of the greatest places of growth. Of You know, God gave us marriage as this glorious, amazing thing to kill us. <laughs> Which is what he wants to do. Right? He, God wants to kill you. He wants to kill your flesh. He, he, and he wants him to rise up out of you. I want to say again, back to, if you find yourself angry, harsh, rude, to your spouse especially, then you've got a self-glorification, exalting problem. You've made you the center of things instead of the Lord. And you may have been that way for 2, 5, 10, 20 years, 
And you probably can't change, but Jesus can change you. Jesus is in the business of setting people free. He came to bind up the brokenhearted. He came to set those free who are in chains and in prison. If we can be faithful to confess our self-centeredness, he will be faithful to begin to set us free from it. I'll close with just trying to reiterate the, the, very, the most practical thing that I can tell you. To get the... So he tells us in the same verse, he came to give us an abundant life and the devil came to steal, kill, and destroy, right? We have, we have the two things at odds. Jesus came to give us the abundant life. That's the table. The devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy by getting a meditation to your table through different avenues, different snares. To follow Jesus means to be a person who is willing to be examined. To be a person that's willing to be opened up and, and made laid bare before the Lord and others. And say, what do you see in me, Lord? Let's get it out of there. And then it is realizing, everything I'm saying today is about glorifying Jesus, Right? Well, it's not glorifying Jesus if we think we can set ourselves free. If I just work hard enough, if I just focus enough, if I can just, no, it, is, it glorifies Jesus when we realize completely, I can't do it, you can do it. And we keep falling at his feet. Well, the woman pressing through the crowd, if I just touch Jesus, he will free me. Guys, if we can just touch Jesus, he'll free us. The most practical thing I can tell you is to make a habit of getting down on your face on a daily basis, reaching out to touch Jesus and asking him to set you free. Believing that he will and that he does, and you, the person that does that, guys, will experience it. Jesus would never look at someone like that and say, no. He looks at it every time and says, absolutely. We know from Scripture that Jesus went to... uh, the Pools of Bethesda one day, we were in the Pools of Bethesda this, this last week reading this story. He went to the Pools of Bethesda and um, says that were, there were many people that were lame and sick there, right? There were a lot of people. How many went up to him and asked for healing? How many got healed? Jesus never turns people away. It's not in his nature. He can't do it. It is up to us to go to him and ask for it. I want to see you experiencing the love of God, and I want to see you fulfilling the purposes of God. And we can't do that in bondage, guys. Jesus wants to bring us freedom. Go get it. Run to him. Cry out to him. Last story, and I'll close. Uh, It's amazing the things that we, we, we realize in our immaturity in Christ that we forget as we grow in Christ. What I mean by that is I remember there was a time in my life where I was saved, but I, you know, I, I wasn't walking with the Lord, was living a very uh, just sinful, sinful life. I don't have to go into details. To the point of, you know, like, I was embarrassed to be around my family. I remember these couple of years embarrassed to be around my family on holidays just because, just the way I was living. I was living with my grandparents at the time because they were letting me live there. I was, because I was spending every dollar I had on just self-fulfilling, partying type things. Um, I remember coming home and one night after partying and getting down on my knees at the bed in my grandparents' house and just crying. I mean I, I mean, I was just bawling. I was crying out, Lord, God, you've got to do something. You've got to change me. I don't want to stay here any longer. So very immature in my faith, but very authentic in crying out, realizing that Jesus could change me. And I can tell you this. I didn't wake up the next morning completely changed, but that day 
started something that changed my life. We forget some of the most basic things that we knew when we first got saved as we mature in our walk. One of the most basic principles in Christianity is to cry out to Jesus. Cry out to God to free us. I don't care who you are, how old you are. He's in the business of freedom. Would you bow your heads? This morning, I want to invite you to do exactly what I'm talking about. I want to invite you to come to Jesus. You know, he's going to do so much more than I can try to present to you this morning. So here I am focused on self-centeredness, but maybe there's another application for you where You just need freedom from Jesus this morning. Whatever it is, start start it today, man. Come to him. Get on your knees and begin to say, Jesus, I I just need you to set me free. I want to know your love. I want to serve you. I I want to fulfill your purpose over my life. I just need you to set me free, Jesus. If you think you're a person that doesn't get their prayers answered, I just gave you a guaranteed way to pray to get your prayers answered. If you pray this prayer, it's going to happen. If you begin to cry out to him to, to bring freedom in your life in a place that you know you bring, you need, he's revealing you need freedom, he will do it. If you want to see your prayers answered, pray that prayer. Repent, confess. It's a good, it's a beautiful thing. Come to him and say, man, I, Jesus, I'm sorry for the way I've been living. I'm sorry for self-centeredness. I'm sorry for fear. I'm sorry. And I don't want to be this way, Jesus. Would you set me free? Allow the power and love of Christ to wash over your heart and mind. And hey, look back up at me in just a minute thought about this so much. I mean, I could just go on testimony after testimony. Uh, Brad Putnam, stand up a minute. Whew, man, I remember, I hope he's okay. I remember about, I don't know, three or four years ago, three, meeting with Brad. And I think I may have shared this a little bit with you guys. Meeting with Brad for lunch. And uh, I'm sure Brad's always been a good guy, but man, he was messed up. <laughs> Brad was messed up. Today, because of Jesus, I I can say emphatically, one of the most humble, seeking after God. Um, Every time I'm around him, I'm just, I'm learning how I need to act. I mean, like, I'm talking a man that just resembles Jesus because he's allowed Jesus to set him free. Now, we could go around the room probably and talk about person after person that that looks like that. Um, And it is simply not because Brad worked hard enough at it. It's because he got to a place where he knew he needed Jesus to do it. Thank you, Brad. You can sit down. You're not here today by chance. This is not some gimmick. This is not trying to work you up into some emotional thing. This is Jesus here wanting to change your life. If we call upon his name, we will be saved. Saved here means whole, delivered, set free. Lord, thank you that you bring freedom. Thank you, Lord, that you bring freedom. This is what you do. 
You set the captives free, Lord. And God, we confess there are places in our life where we are, we are, we are held in bondage and chains and, and we've allowed the enemy to have a seat at our table through buying into a lie that he's presented. And he's, he's convinced the whole world that if we just focus on ourselves, that is the key to being free. When you said if we could just focus on you, that is the key. So God, we reject his lie. We receive your truth. And we, we, we bow before you. We throw any crowns, any accolades, God, anything that we think that we've done, we throw it at your feet because you alone are worthy. And we ask you to bring freedom to our lives, Lord. As I finish praying, if we could have the, the prayer, the altar team come up and gather around the stage. We're going to be available just to pray for you today. Um, God, thank you that um, your grace is sufficient. Thank you, Lord, that your mercies are new every morning. Thank you, God, that I can blow it so many times, but your mercies are just, you're so, you're so faithful in them. But God, let us not take for granted this life and the opportunity we have to be free. I'm fixing to finish praying. Guys, this morning, I want to challenge you to run to Jesus, but maybe you're in a place where you're like, I don't even know how to pray. I need someone to pray with me. I need someone to help me. Um, that's why these guys are up here this morning. They're here to, to pray with you, to love on you, to help you get connected with God. If you're having a hard time being connected to Jesus, they want to help you get connected to him. So we're going to close by pursuing, by running to him, by asking for freedom, whether that's sitting where we're at or we're asking for help from from someone else in the body. So Lord, as we come to you, thank you that you always have a yes to this prayer. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank you, Jesus. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords, Prince of peace, wonderful counselor, mighty God. Bless you. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray.